Today I'm supposed to address it is false that truth does not need defending. Now I said to somebody beforehand I was going to confess something about this year's lectureship, the theme, and the topics. And uh, what happened was, you know, I was privileged to be able to be around Brother Warren. Several other preachers have all gone on when I was a young man, and they impressed me greatly with not just their ability in the pulpit, but what they knew, and in the particular areas that they were uh, learned in. And I was digging through some things last fall and found uh, something from Brother Warren. And each one of these topics was a topic that he had come up with. I altered them some, actually. But the idea was there. They're not original with me. But there's one thing that stands out in these is that the analytical mind, the systematic mind of Brother Warren, in analyzing a, a subject. Anybody that goes back to the old spiritual swords when he edited them will see a thorough examination of any topic that he dealt with. And he would break it down so that when you finished, you had a thorough knowledge of it. And I think you see from these particular statements that he did the same thing in this. So much so that I think two or three of the speakers, if not all, felt like, well, what's the difference in what I'm saying and what somebody else is saying? Well, all truth is going to touch upon other truth and harmonize with it. And this was just simply his way of breaking down this particular uh, study of some false concepts of truth. I just decided to use it in this particular lectureship, especially when I got through looking at it, it filled every slot that we had open. So why look anywhere else? My topic means that the truth does need defending. When you say it's false that truth does not need defending, then you can do like Bruce did last night and say, truth does not need defending. Is that true or is that false? And therefore, the topic, it is false that truth does not need defending. In fact, it's one of the most ridiculous things that I've ever heard of to say that truth, and especially God's truth, does not need defending. But if you look and if you read, you'll find our own brethren of the far left uh, have come up with ideas like that. If you want to see a couple of good manuscripts, one more lengthy than the other, again, go to Brother Doug McClish's uh, scripture cache, and he has a couple articles in there, at least two. <laughs> one is a, a sort of more abbreviated than the other concerning that very point because we had those people saying, oh, you don't need, you know, truth just stands by itself. It doesn't need defending. Now, here's the point about that. When you make that statement, you're defending what you think the truth is about truth. And what you're going to find is that one of the easiest ways to deal with any subjective relativist is that when you pin them down, they're not relativists. I read one particular article. In fact, I have a copy of it. And he entitled it, Truth Does Not Need Defending. And then he spends four or five paragraphs or more explaining why truth does not need to be defended, which means what he thought was the truth needed to be defended. Now, I was listening to Brother Warren on a tape that I found a while back, and when it came to talking about that, and Brother Warren was as capable as anybody in his vocabulary and learning ability to express himself. He came to that kind of thing in his sermon, and he stopped and looked at everybody and said, I, I don't know the way you can express yourself on that. That's just dumb. <laughs> and uh, I thought, that's, well, what else can you say? So before I go into specifics, I want to mention some things about truth. 
What are we talking about? There's some assumptions here. If truth needs to be defended, what is it that we're defending? I've used this illustration before. In a philosophy class, the final test was being taken and the professor was at his desk and as the students finished their test, they came and brought their test up to the teacher at his desk. And there's always somebody like this in every class. They think they know all that's possible to know and they know nothing, usually. But they don't know they know nothing because nothing to them is something. So they know something. Anyway, he comes up, puts his test paper down, and looks at the professor and says, do I exist? And the professor was busy, and he looks up at him over his glasses and said, who wants to know? <laughs> now, you may not realize it, but what he was doing there was dealing with the very beginnings and first principles of how you begin to find out the truth. When you say, is it possible to know what truth is, to find truth, then you can begin at the most basic or with the most basic premise. It's undeniable. In fact, if you're listening to me trying to understand me, then that proves you exist. And the fact that this student came up and said, do I exist? indicating what brain he had was being used to contemplate himself and to be able to ask, do I exist, was self-evident that he did. And that's what the pro professor was pointing out to them, who wants to know. In other words, if you ask that question, you identify yourself as a being, you are. And so the mere fact you can question truth or yourself means you exist. Now. This is what we call an axiom or first principle according to, we've heard his name mentioned earlier, Aristotle. First principles or self-evident points. Did you catch something that sounds a little like the, the founding fathers of the United States? Self-evident. That's because they were learned men and they were thinking men. This uh, demonstrates their existence without proof. Who wants to know? Well, how are you going to answer that question? That's self-evident by the fact you asked the question and that you heard another question put back to you that says, you dummy, you exist. And we're living in an age, folks, to where when you hear some of the comments made by people and you, I hope, will connect back with what was said this morning, you will understand why some people will say, well, you don't have to defend the truth. Just listen to what they're saying. I, I liked especially having what was said by Brother Moses this morning toward the end of things, that they have an agenda. They knew where they were headed all the time, but they outdo the church because we want the world one for Christ as we want to say tomorrow. And if what we're doing doesn't work, we quit. They never quit. Generation. After generation, they're content to slug it on, going forward five steps and going back four. But they never stop until they completely indoctrinate a whole world. And that's exactly what's going on. It was Rene Descartes who uttered the famous, I think, therefore I am, which proves that I, you, exist even if someone told you you didn't exist, you would still have to think about your existence and that proves it's self-evident that you exist. That's the truth. So, therefore, proving the one who told you did not exist to be what? Wrong. Long time ago, Brother Deaver said to a student came back from college and said to him, they just keep telling me that you can't know the truth. Brother Deaver said, I said, just go ahead and know it anyway. And that's the way it is when it comes to I think, therefore I am. I know I exist. And we're at the height of intellectual lunacy when somebody has all this background, first of all, among a lot of people who've gone before that were admittedly great thinkers, 
and you're trying to figure out things like this. It's no wonder we're in the mess we're in. So existence, to be aware of yourself, proves existence. Reason, to think about yourself, proves that you do reason. Those are self-evident. We can logically conclude we exist and we can have reason and thought about our existence. Aristotle notes that there are these three principles I want to, and they're called the laws of thought, and I'll try not to spend a long time on these. I asked in the Wednesday night class a few weeks ago, anybody ever heard of the law of non-contradiction? I got blank stares. I was a little bit hurt by that because we've dealt with these things a long time here. But it always goes back to what Brother N.B. Hardeman told Brother G.K. Wallace, never underestimate the ignorance of your audience. And I try not to. Now, you think that's a slur and a slam on the audience. No, it's not. It's the way we are. If inspiration through Peter in writing to Christians could say, this second epistle, beloved, now now write unto you, in which both I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. He's saying, I already taught you this. Don't forget it. So rather than have you forget it, I'm going to tell it to you again. So we all need that. I don't care who you are. You can be as learned a person as there is. But uh, to admit ignorance is probably one of those things that's going to help you grow more in understanding and drive you to do those things to remember. So what is the law of non-contradiction? Well, we can uh, dress it up in very simple language, and we'll go like this. A is not non-A. But that doesn't seem to work too well unless you're dealing in those areas a whole lot to really come across like you want it to, to state the importance and to understand the law of non-contradiction. Here's what it comes down to for an example. If an atheist believes God does not exist and a theist believes God does exist, it's impossible for both of them to be right. I remember Brother Warren one time in some place he was preaching. He says, you want to see how rational we are? He said, I have a grandson. This was when his grandchildren were small. And we we're talking about 35 years ago at least. He said, "My little, he told how old he was and called his name. I think he was three, four, something like that. He said, if he comes in and whatever he called him, Grandpa, Boompa, Foopa, whatever, he says, where is my tricycle? He said, if I tell him the tricycle is in this room and in the backyard in exactly the same time, he said, he's going to look at me and may not say anything, but he's going to be completely befuddled because he knows that's impossible. He may be able to explain it, but he knows it can't be. It cannot be. A is not non-A. God either exists our God does not exist. And that is the law of non-contradiction, very practical way. Now, there's another law. And I remind you, these are not invented laws. They're not invented. Any more of the laws of hermeneutics are invented. Man didn't come up with them. There's a word we don't use much nowadays. It's called coval. It means it's just simply like it is because it's like it is. It's the way it works. So when you look at these law of non-contradiction and the second one, we know and probably have heard of more of the law of the excluded middle, that's either A or non-A. God cannot exist and not exist. In other words, there's, there's no cracks in between for it to fall between. It's that simple. And then one other, the law of identity, A is A. That simply states that something is what we say A is. Jack Stevens is a human being. There it is. Law of identity. Law of identity. When someone says, I, I love the book, it's understood. He, he meant book. <laughs> there can be no communication without this. It's impossible. Now remember, we're created by God. We're created intellectual and rational by God with a will to choose one way or the other, to think about things. If nothing else, I think therefore I am. And that's the beginning point. That's where you begin, to use what God gave you. Now, when God revealed himself to us, he revealed himself to us in two ways. One's very general. 
what used to be called natural theology, what is done in the universe, the laws of the universe, and so forth. But now you can contemplate the moon and the orbits of all the planets and all such stuff as that as deeply as anybody possibly can. And you'll never learn the plan of salvation. You understand God regarding salvation of man and why he needs it and save from what and so on because of revelation. That's been well set this morning. Well, he revealed himself in words, did he not? He revealed himself in words. Paul said, when you read what I wrote, you'll understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. When you read what I wrote. Because he wrote by inspiration, 2 Timothy 3.16. The Holy Spirit revealed the mind of God through men. He did it in words. Words are vehicles of thought. They are signs of ideas. Signs of what? Ideas. I think, therefore I am. So God has revealed himself to us the way he made us to come to understanding. Therefore God is or he is not. And so on down the line with these laws. So, what is truth? Well, to think about the answer, first of all, we've seen proves we exist. Existence proves the state of reality. And to think about oneself proves reason. These are two axioms or undeniable facts. I exist, I reason. Truth is an expression, a symbol, or statement that matches or corresponds to its object or referent. Truth must correspond to reality in order to be true. Truth is just what a thing is. If you speak something about a thing that is not like it is, you speak a lie. And we know who's the father of lies. I'm laying groundwork to tell you why the truth needs defending. Because there is a being who's the father of lies and a lie is contrary to the truth and contradistinctive to the truth. Now, if you consider what is said in John 1 about the Word, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same as in the beginning with God. Now look at verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus is truth, and he says as much in John 14, 6. Jesus said of himself, I am, he said, the way and the life. But what did he say in the middle of it? I am not only the way, I am not only the life. Just leave those two out for a moment to make our point in view of our subject. Jesus said, I am the truth. And there's a whole lot you can get into in John 1. I mentioned sometime in class about the word logos, that in effect he's actually saying, in the beginning was the logos. In the beginning was intellect and reason. Eternal intellect and reason. God is love, but God is truth. Now, you need to keep that in, in mind as we go into this, absolute truth is something true for all people and all times and all places, and it doesn't change. Do you realize how fundamental that is, but how few people will stop and just break it down that way? One thing, Jeff mentioned this a while back, said I hadn't read the ancient philosophers in a while, and of course I guess getting ready for some of this, he said I went back and started reading them, and that's right. I do not know how those fellows, not believing in the God of the Bible, without revelation from God, were able to take their reasoning powers with the natural world around them and come to some of the amazing conclusions they came to just by contemplating and thinking straight. But they did. Does that mean they were right in a lot of things? No, they were so messed up on a lot of things, it was pitiful. They didn't know the God of the Bible. They didn't know those things at all. But as far as reasoning with the mind God gave them, they were able to conclude that there's even a higher power or powers, and you don't fly into the face of a higher power or power. 
You submit to it. That was their thinking. Now, that brings us down to can truth be relative or subjective. All these things I know have been talked about somewhat. But I want us to understand that one reason we're in the mess we're in today when it comes to morality is because they bought this bill of goods. Brother Moses talked about this morning. Because what I've said thus far in a lot of places would be challenged right and left. Now, they would contradict themselves if they tried to challenge it, but they would try to... Um, say that truth is subjective and it's relative. It's a popular view. It's the thing to be. And these are the people who will say, all oh, truth doesn't need defending. Well, I want to ask them, what do you mean by truth? It's sort of like talking to a Jehovah's Witness who says that, uh, yeah, you have a spirit. Well, I believe I have a spirit. But I know from studying Jehovah's Witness doctrine, they do not mean by spirit what the Bible means by spirit. They literally mean it's just the breath you breathe in and out. So when it comes to these folks saying, yeah, they believe in truth, I wonder what they mean, subjective truth. And that's what most of them mean. If you will look at what's going on in the headlines and the papers and people doing the things they're doing, then they're basically saying to me, this is my truth. You're telling me I lied when I hired people to beat me up or appear to be? Not to that man's mind if he is truly a relativist. He has decided that's what was what and that was truth to him and it worked for him when he thought it would and so on. And that's the reason you get all this mess going on, people intellectually crazy. That's exactly what it is. You can be psychologically goofy, you can be emotionally messed up, but you can be just as intellectually crazy as a woodpecker with his brain in backwards. That's, that's exactly where we're at today. And they're with PhDs in schools, and they're teaching our young people all this kind of stuff. Now, what's the main reasons people give for holding the subjective view? Well, things appear to be true only at some time and not others. That's always nice. Or things appear to be true only for some people but not others. That was talked about this morning. But now you might be surprised at what has laid the groundwork for this. And they, don't, they wouldn't accept it, but it's true. It does not make any difference what you believe, just so you're sincere. Who has taught that? The denominations. They taught it when it comes down to church, worship, how you're saved. It doesn't make a difference what you believe, just so you're sincere. But somebody comes along in the area of morals and says, if that's true when it comes to matters of religion, why wouldn't it be true when it comes to matter of morality? And so, if you're homosexual, you've been raised in that background, why can't you say it does not make any difference what I believe, just so I'm sincere? And it doesn't make any difference whether you hire people to beat you up because you don't think you're getting paid enough or whatever, just so you're sincere. And how are you going to prove if that is the case, that Lee Harvey Oswald shot President Kennedy, how are you going to prove him wrong? If he was sincere, what well, he did. And this, therefore, allows for everything to go on. Now, back in the days of the judges, you know, this is not new on the earth, the scripture says, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That means, folks, if you lived in those days, you better have your warrior accoutrements on anywhere you went because somebody might decide that you were worthy of being batted upside the head and take what you got if he was sincere in what he wanted to do, and that was right in his own eyes. That's where we're headed today in America. And brethren, it was said this morning, you just move a little bit, or was it last night? I don't remember which now. And you move a little bit here and then draw that line. time you get over here about 50 miles or 100, you're well off base. Well, guess what's happening in America? That little deviation started a long, long time ago, and now we're way off base. Now, what does that have to do with us in defending the truth? First of all, know your enemy. No, they may not believe in the plenary verbal inspiration of the scriptures. They may approach the Bible like some have already pointed out. 
without saying that is absolute objective truth. And that's where you have the old denominational view coming out. That's just your interpretation. So the Bible, you know, you, hear, you take the Bible, teach anything with it. Well, if you teach it as the Bible was meant, rightly divided, knowing how to ascertain the authority of the Bible, you can't. You just teach the truth. You teach what's in it. But if you want to start, and the Bible talks about this, if you want to start resting the scriptures, you can make it say whatever you want it to say. So what do we do? Well, you know, you couldn't have such passages as 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 if truth is not absolute and it's objective. It's the same to everybody and it doesn't change at all. Listen to Psalm 94, 16 and tell me how you can be a subjective relativist when you hear this. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? How could there be evildoers? And how could there be workers of iniquity if there's no absolute objective truth? How do you do that? Because what he calls evildoers and workers of iniquity may look all right to me. May be what I want to do. The abortionist who really believes in what he does doesn't think he's doing wrong because he ever has a different concept of what's right and wrong. You say, oh, I don't believe people to do that. Uh, do you believe in the Holocaust? Do you believe that the Nazis did what they did? You know, they did that based upon a false philosophy. Brother Warren used to say that the philosophers lead the theologians around by the nose. That every theologian with his THD is doing his best to learn the updated philosophy so they're not looked down on by the philosophers. Well, I believe that true biblical philosophy is what we all ought to be, a lover of truth. Above all, a lover of God's truth. Jesus said, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, what is that truth? Can we know it? Let's go on even further. If you take Jude 3 and 4, that is the verses. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, now, is that true or is it not? Is it the case or is it not? Which gets us down to having to say, does God exist? If he does, is he the God of the Bible? Is he the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? Is the Bible the plenary verbal inspired word of God? If it is, must we rightly divide the word of truth and know God's will for our lives? Yes, 2 Timothy 2.15. Must we act only by the authority of the words of the New Testament to be saved? Yes, Colossians 3.17. But you see, if anything means anything to everybody and to anybody... Just because you're sincere in believing it, you don't know what to do. There's no use me standing here and saying anything or anything else. There's no reason to do all that kind of stuff because I don't know how you're understanding this. I remember one time at the, at the lectures at Freed Harbor when they were worth going to, and Brother Woods handled the open forum, and the fellow stood up one time and said, Brother Woods, did I understand you to say? And Brother Woods said, I don't know what you understood me to say. How do I know what you understood me to say? <laughs> well, that's the way people are. I, I don't even know now what you're understanding me to say. I've got to be sure I say what the Word of God says. That gets on Wayne's lesson this morning. All these lessons are designed to fit together, folks. I've got to be sure that I do what Paul said. Preach the Word. Now I've got to study the Bible to know what that means. But I know how to do it. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Now I have to know what reprove, rebuke, and exhort is. With all long suffering. God know what that means. It relates to this context. And uh, doctrine. And what doctrine is. And so on. How do, you, how do you know anything without knowing the meaning of the words? Therefore, in a debate, you define your proposition. You, you can't be understood unless you define yourself. 
Therefore, you get away from words that are too generic and you don't know what they mean, and that causes misunderstanding. I've seen people just literally have what's called in logic a verbal dispute because they're sitting there arguing a case, and each one of them using words, giving different meanings to the, to the words. Well, there's no way you're going to arrive at any kind of conclusion on anything or have a profitable study when you're talking about one particular term, but you give one definition to it, and he gives another defi to, definition to it or some type of thing like that. There has to be something solid and sound, and that's the way that it is. If I take the position just so I'm sincere, I say, uh, Bruce is a monkey. Well, with his mustache, I say he's a walrus. No, Bruce says I'm not a monkey or a walrus. I'm a human being, and I'm Bruce Stulting, a faithful gospel preacher, etc., etc., etc. And he can say all that he wants to. But if I want him to be what I said he was, that's what he is. Now, how are you ever going to function in a society like that? Well, just look at what's in government today. Look at what's on the far left. And you're seeing that kind of thing. You say, well, I can't believe people are that way. Start believing the facts before your eyes. Start believing the facts regarding the church that we're in the throes of an apostasy for some of the reasons we're talking about right now, and that is you don't have to defend the truth. It just defends itself. Again, that's one of the most asinine comments I've ever heard in my life. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. If there's not absolute objective truth pertaining to salvation, what in the world is he talking about? What does it mean to prove? In the context, all things. And hold fast that which is good. Well, I can't know what's good. Good's anything, as long as I feel sincere about it. How do I know? Well, come on down then, and you see why some of these new hermeneuticals that's already been mentioned, that started coming out back in the 80s, they're trying to say that all the Bible is is a narrative. It's a love letter saying God loves you. You're lost. You can't save yourself. Jesus can. Accept that. And then go ahead and do anything else you want to do. That's basically what they're saying. But then you've got scriptures like all scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect at 30 furnished to every good work. Now let's bring it down to some specifics. You do not have to partake of the Lord's Supper and the worship assembly of the saints on the first day of the week. Period. What do you say about that? You're going to oppose it? But the truth doesn't need defending. So if I believe that you must partake of the Lord's Supper as one of the acts of worship in the assembly of the saints on the first day of the week, and somebody else says you don't, I can't say anything. And, of course, if they say anything, then they go bonkers in contradicting themselves because they, they either must be completely quiet or else they become somebody who believes in absolute objective truth because they believe that that should be bound on everybody. But a relativist can't say what he believes ought to be bound on everybody. He's a relativist. <laughs> so he's even forced back in the definition of terms. And so they're just simply firming in ignorance. That's what it amounts to. That's what's being taught. We're, we're destroying thousands of years of analytical investigation and thinking and doing it under the guise that this is a higher form of examining and seeing the world and learning how to live. You say, how did we get it that way? Because we've let people get in chief positions and taking kids who came out of families where things weren't very well taught anyway. And they exposed these guys, as was already pointed out, that love to change things and love to confuse. I had a professor, and now this goes back a long way. I was in my second semester of my freshman year at state school in the English course, and it was a liter literature course. And when the fellow really taught literature, what the course was all about, I enjoyed it. But he considered himself one of these, like we heard about, that loved to confuse. And we had a few disagreements. I was 18 years old. He was probably late 40s. So I said, I'm going to tell him something before I leave this class, whether it's, he likes it or not. Of course, it didn't pick too good a time to do it. I was turning in my final test paper. 
But I walked up to him, and I just laid it down. I said, I won't tell you how much I really enjoyed this course when you taught literature. But I said, for the rest of this stuff you taught, it doesn't matter to hill of beans. You know what he did? He says, I didn't bother him. But he thought he was the apostle of confuse these kids from these country backgrounds that basically all went to church somewhere and believed in God and the Bible. And when you get them confused, then you can start directing them the way you want them to go. And that's gone on now for a long, long time in this country. And guess what? It's infiltrated the colleges. And I'll leave you with this one idea. Some of you may have heard of Dr. James Atterbury, who was a longtime teacher and head of the English department at Harding. I know Dub knows. And in a summer workshop for the teachers in about 1968, he made a comment to the effect, we cannot know absolute truth. It's just out there, and we see it, and we strive for it, but we never get there, so all we can do is keep striving for it. Well, at that time, Brother Bales took him to task, and it became a big blowout at, uh, at Harding at that time. A lot of teachers left. Of course, Pepperdine was glad to snap him up. That shows you how far they were back 50 years ago. But let me ask you something. If you cannot arrive at absolute objective truth, how do you know that there was truth out there that you couldn't attain, you could just strive after? Again, they just simply contradict themselves. That's been going on for a long, long time. And I remember, ah, he's older than I am, but he was a young man then, because this was in the hippie, hippie days. Thomas Reppert in the speech department wrote an article to the Arkansas Gazette and said this. After all that uproar and these teachers left, some of them got fired. God is dead. He was found floating face down in the Harding College lily pond. And there's a heap of brethren never knew that was going on. And they grinned big and just said, oh, we've got to send their kids to Christian University so we can make sure they stay right. And they sent them to a place to educate them to go to hell is what they did. Let me ask you a question. If you go to a state school and you're around people that drink and booze and carry on like they do, and your child's influenced by it and they go to hell. Are they any, any worse off than the person who goes to a place where you think you're putting them in the hands of people who are devoted to the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of God's will, and are living exemplary lives, and they're teaching them the way of righteousness, but they're not. They're teaching them what I've been talking about. Now, when both of them get to hell, who's better off? That comes from just not investigating things. But here's the key, and I'll stop here. 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That's the way it works. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Just keep on knowing it no matter what they say. Thank you. <laughs>